Shalom Rastafari. We continue with Kitasa. Kitasa to Kabla. Kuta to Kabla. And now we want to bring up the brazen, uh, the laver, so you can see a better picture of the, the laverate here. As you can see, this is the brazen laverate here. Let's try to get a little larger, a little larger representation so you can see this more more in full. Let's pull this down to understand the brazen laver to see some of the elements, see the elements of the tabernacle. And then when we overlay the cross, the mescal of Christ, here's where you really see the wisdom of God. You know, we're saying where the almighty John, he, he plans long range, long term. All he asks is for ones to exercise faithful witness. He proves himself. But the people had failed and proved themselves faithless. Now, right here, this is um, this is what the, what they call the um, the the ka the 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 ka or or some say the key or the key or or the brazen lava. Now, what's interesting is that this lava, where the priest had to wash, it was donated by the woman and the Kohanim they they wash themselves before entry into the inner court. Now what is symbolized by this um by the the brazen lava is spiritual cleansing. In other words the washing the washing by the Devar or Debar or the word the Kal of the scriptures as we are often and continuously defiled in our daily walk, especially in this world, we're continually being defiled. So the spiritual overstanding of Shemot 30, 17 to 21, or Exodus chapter 30, um, verses 17 to 21, is spiritual cleansing. Now, when we had likened the word in 5... Um, Ephesians 5. Let's just look at Ephesians 5 for a moment so you just can see the spiritual connection. So though we see in the Old Testament the types, the Bible calls it the shadows, we see the fulfillment now in Christ. We see the fulfillment spiritually or metaphysically. So we're learning by these actual symbols from the Old Testament, the tabernacle structure. You understand the tabernacle structure and other elements too. Even when we talk about the brazen, um, we talk about the golden calf. You know, saying nobody worships physically a a golden cow so much, but it's what that what that's a a similitude or a symbol or a a hiero like a hieroglyph. You know, the hieroglyphs they were they were. Um, um, images of, of things and tools that, that stood for deeper levels. We do it in slang. In slang a lot, you can see that we use a slang, but that slang has many layers to it. In the same way, um, the word has many layers and the reference points of the word. So when we look at um, the spiritual meaning of the laver, and remember the laver is between the brazen altar is placed between the brazen altar now what's the brazen altar symbolic of some say the foot of the cross in a sense and even the cross itself would be a symbol of the brazen altar now we are not going to go through some of the details i say some of the details that if you look through the scripture um the altar has a has an interesting reference um, the brazen altar to like when we, when they say we come to Christ, we come to the feet of, 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 of the Savior, we come to the feet of the Mass, like the woman who washed his feet. It's like coming to that, that brazen altar in that sense, except this is before the crucifixion. So what she was doing in a sense was what the woman donated here in the washing, right, in the washing of the priest's hands and the feet before what entry into the inner court. This is why Christos would say that what the woman has done, she's preparing, you understand, for my death. 
You understand? Because after the, the death and the resurrection of Yeshua, he entered into the inner court. So when we look at Revelation and we understand Revelation, the book of Revelation, it's impossible to comprehend Revelation without understanding the tabernacle. Because when we look at the tabernacle and the pattern of the tabernacle, Revelation is, is based on that template. You understand? Based on that template of the tabernacle. So when a lot of folks, they get into Revelation not understanding Torah, they make a lot of erroneous a lot of erroneous assumptions about what Revelation is speaking about. So there's a point where Christ is, is in the inner court, you understand, and he's in the Holy of Holies, and now we have the Ark of the Covenant, which is similar to when we say God is on the throne, in other words. He is on the throne. Now, Moses, we know, converse with the Moshiach or with Joshua on the Mount of Transfiguration, as well as Elias. So we have in the New Testament the two witnesses. Now, spiritually speaking, the two witnesses, when we study Moses, right, and the Israelites, and we study um, um, Elias or Elijah, it's interesting because we look at the state of the people. In Elijah's time, there was Jezebel. Remember, in Elijah's time, there was Jezebel. There was the false prophets, the, 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 the Balaam, the worshipers of Baal. You understand, like those of Babylon today, those of the Luna Nutty and all the skull and bones, all the same kind of a thing. The, the, the Jezebel symbol, we, we can link in, link in and liken that with um, um, the spiritual harlotry and the worshiping of the image of the beast and the false prophet, you understand, and even the false prophetess as well. Now, we can see types. You know, we can point out certain people, but it's not so much to um, point out individuals. You ever saying like, okay, we're going to talk about this person in the news and that person in the news because we all have fallen short, and it's not even about them so much, but it's about Jah's word. You ever know saying? And it's what we do in Jah's word, not just pointing out these people in the world. So we're not going to really, not that we're not going to name names. Certain people have to be named, but it's, it's, it's overstanding what this is symbolic of and its applicability. So this is a spiritual cleansing that we are speaking of when we're speaking of the when we're speaking of the the laver. So we have a chapter here, chapter thirty, speaking of the tabernacle. First is the altar of incense, and this is called the great worship chapter. So at the end of at the end of last. Um, at the end of last week's portion and, and this week's, we had the, let's bring up the, if we can, the, the brazen, the brazen, um, or the golden, excuse me, the golden, the golden altar. We just touched about the, um, about the brazen lava. Here's the golden altar right here. You understand? The, the golden altar. Now, what is this? What 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 does this link with? Take down these scriptures. This is we spoke on this previously. This from previous Levitical reading and feeding. This is the uh, Mizbach Ha Keterot, like Gata Gata, like Gata and uh, Ket uh, Gata. That's the Keterot, the Gatarot, the Keterot, the Keterot, right? The Mizbach Ha Keterot, or the altar of the incense. Now Shemot or Exodus. Uh, 25 and 18, it speaks about the intimacy with Yahweh, the Aishans, his intimacy. Now, it's interesting that in this great worship chapter, the Aishans is mentioned first. Not mentioned only, but it's mentioned first. And even before the, the because when you're mo moving into now the inner, notice, moving into the inner, you're moving into the inner, in the sense, the inner sanctum, the consistence of prayer or the, cons the the constancy of prayer life. So the Aishans is a symbolic or a symbol of prayer, as we see in Revelation where it says about how the prayers of the saints, and, and, and I think Revelation 5 and 8, Revelation 8, 3 to 4, it speaks about how the prayers of the saint rises up to Jah, rises up to God, rises up to heaven as the Aishans. And we find that also within the Psalms, 
where it says, you know, may the prayers be acceptable like unto the Aishans, like unto the incense, the evening, you know, the evening incense. Well, that's all based on the foundation of the Orit or Torah. So in order to overstand or receive Christ in the New Testament, we have to recognize that he's fulfilling the old archetype. He's bringing into the, the manifestation you understand the spiritual, metaphysical way. So these types are very important to study. So here, there's some scriptures that go along with this right here. But we're pointing that out because that's the beginning of of this 30th chapter that's called the Great Worship Chapter. Now, we touched on the shekel, you understand? We touched on the the bir, the bir, you understand? The bir, bir, the bir, right? We touched on that. I'm working on, you know, the pronunciation, those the stammering lips and the tongue of another people. You understand the lost sheep of the Beta Israel practice does make perfect. We touched on the, the, the cleanse. It's important to pay careful attention to this part about the cleanse because that's in this. This is from last week's, but just to link, link these two parts of the same chapter. Now, here we're speaking about this this cleansing here, which is a spiritual taken in the Moshiach, taken in the, the revelation of the King of Kings and his Christ, it's a spiritual cleansing, you understand, which is washing by the word of scriptures as we are often defiled in our daily walk. First John 5 and 8, um, um, let's see, uh, 13 and, and 8, um, Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. But one of our, I won't say favorites, but I think this one here accurately um, states it, because speak about the inner life of the spirit, the menfasawi, the tawahido, mitmanan. It says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to Adonai. It doesn't speak of this praise and worship nonsense that a lot of counterfeit churches are speaking about, but speaking of psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody, you will say, with the harmony of the instrument that Yahweh has given us, our voices. You understand? With, with the basic, with, with basic accompaniment, you understand, like the heartbeat. That is the true so-called praise and worship, giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we give thanks to who? To God, the Father, our Godfather, Kedus Abatachin, in the name of Getachin Adonenu, our Adonai, Joshua HaMoshiach. We're in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 20, verse 19 and 20 we just read, right? Now, it's interesting right here because now it's a connection with the, with the married life. You know what I'm saying? So it speaks to the individual, mitmanon, the males and female, by using the type of Israel as being married, you know what I'm saying, to Adonai, to the Lord. So here the married life of the spirit filled mitmanon as illustrating Christos and the church. You know, we wonder why so many relationships and, and you know, like within the black community and just within so-called Western Gentile Christian society is so messed up, divorce rates are through the roof because they're not practicing the true spirituality. You see, as above, so below. If they're practicing the true relationship of, of, of the church or the congregation, with the master in and according to being washed by his word, you know, and to cleanse that constant defilement, then our relationship with one another, in other words, if we take care of the vertical relationship, you know, then with Samayat, with Abuna Zebe Samayat, with our Father who art in heaven, the name of Adunenu, Joshua, Yahshua, HaMoshia, then our horizontal relationships, are worked out. You over that? So what what happens is that people try to work out their horizontal relationships, each one trying to master each with schemes and, and all kind of mixed up moods and attitudes, and we forget about that vertical relationship. 
You understand? So we're no longer we're no longer looking to the Samayat or the Samayawi, the heavenly, but we're caught up in the earthly and we even go below that and fall into hell and bring hell on earth because of denying God and denying his way and denying his word. That's where we're at right now. But there's there is hope for those who are here and as it says here, submitting yourselves one to another in the reverence of God, not submitting to each other because you're afraid of this one, what that one's going to do to you or, or to get some, you know, to get something, some material garbage, some money or, or, or whatnot or sell your soul, some nonsense. No, submitting yourselves one to another in the reverence of God, you understand, in the reverence of Jah. So we submit to each other and seek to live this way you know what I'm saying? Because of our reverence of the Almighty. But if there's no reverence, like I said, there's no fear of Jah before their eyes. So any man of evil is possible. And this is the state of the present end time world. But it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the reverence of God, because what it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. So this world has no fear of Yahweh, no fear of Adonai, no fear of the King of Kings or his Christ, so therefore there's no wisdom. This is why so much God-awful foolishness, you understand, is busting out at the seams. It says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Uh-oh, feminists will jump on you for that. What do you mean, submit yourself? Well, the husband should submit himself to the wife. You know, people got everything on ass backwards. You know, you put the you put cart before the donkey, the, the donkey don't go in the opposite direction. You know what I mean? It's not going to push the cart forward. No, it's going to turn around and go backwards. And that's where we're at right now. But here's the key for the sisters, too. Because true, some of the brethren and some of us in immaturity might might use this authority wrongly because we we haven't grown up. You understand? We haven't been born again and then grow up. As Bob said, it's not how long you've been a Rasta, a Rasta Fry, or how long you've been in a church, or how long you've been a Christian, but it's how long it takes you to grow. You see, how long it takes you to grow. You know, you got these one-day Christians running around starting churches. That's part of the problem that's going on. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to Adonai, as to the Lord. Now, if you have a husband who is not submitting himself to Joshua, Yeshua, you know, you'd be a fool basically right there. I'm, you know, we're not giving personal people counsel, but everything must be in order. You see, the, the male is the head of the woman, but in the Lord. So if your man has Babylon on his head and you want to be a good, a good, a good faithful one, then don't be a stupid one. You understand? Because his head is not Christ. So you're not under any obligation in Jah's word. This is plain and simple. Some people say, oh, you're trying to cause trouble. Well, you know, Christ says that don't think I come to bring peace. You know, you know, we have to divide in order to find out who's of Jah, who's, of, who's not of Jah. Because in this chapter on the golden calf, you're going to find out something very interesting. Because in this chapter on the golden calf, I love when Moses, when he comes down and see what the people have been doing. He asked, well, who's on my side? And it was the Levites, and the Levites drew their swords in order to cleanse the defilement. But see, no one is drawing their swords to cleanse the defilement. People are drawing their swords for the same filthy lucre of the world. They're drawing their swords for, for, for the golden calf and the idols of gold and silver and drawing their sword for, for Dumanati and, 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 and Dumadati and, and Luna Natty and all this kind of crazy sh stuff. You know what I mean? That's what, they're, that's what they're fighting for. As Bob said in Berhan and Selassie, he was sitting in one of his interviews, you know, they're fighting, you know, for the system. It's like the, the, the uh, what's his name in the Matrix movie, Morpheus. So many of these people are so inert that they would, you know, that they would fight, you know, you know, that they would fight for this system. You understand? They would fight for slavery. They would, they would fight for the devil. You understand why? Because there's no reverence of Jah before their eyes. Let me show you a clip of the Simpsons, woman do the Simpsons thing. She's a Scientology something or another. There's one of these new gods that just sprout, sprung up, J.R. Hubbard or whatever. And they ask her, you know, um, who's God to her? And she stumbles around, stumbles around, and after a while she says, basically, she's trying to be this. Notice, when you listen to that interview, they ask her, who's God to her? Describe God. And she's, oh, ah, e, ah, ooh, ah, well, ah. And then when she gets down to the end of it, she says, well, she's trying to be this. Be what? She never even named what God is to her. 
You know what I'm saying? But since the fool says in their heart there is no God, and if there's no fear of God before their eyes, all nations that forget Jah are turned to hell. Why do you think things are getting worse and worse in these godless societies? You know what I'm saying? No amount of law and legislation by men and people, man-made law, is going to stop Jah's judgment. It's written in the heavens. For the husband is the head, the ras of the wife, even as Christos, the Moshiach, is the head of the church. So the first thing I'll say to you, sisters, is to learn, well, how is Christ the head of the church? How does he operate with the church? You see, and brothers, we have to know these standards, too, because our sisters are going to learn, and our daughters, our mothers, our wives, they need to know this. So we can submit ourselves one to another in the reverence, which means in the order of Jah. It says, um, as he is the savior of the body, therefore, as the church is subject to Christos, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. But remember the context. It says, as to Adonai. It says, the Adonai, Yeshua, is the head of the man. So men, Make Yeshua your head. In other words, put his testimony in your head and your heart and seek to work it out. This is why the spiritual cleansing is not just bathing. It's bathing, yes, physically bathing. But what bathes our soul? What bathes our psyche, our conscience that gets defiled by so many things in this world? It is the word. And now here's to the husbands. It says, husbands, love your wives. Even as Christos also loved the church and did what? And he gave himself for it. He gave himself for it. What will you give yourself for? For for the dollar, for the love of money? What will you give yourself for? A, a Luna Nutty? Luna Nutty? What, what will you give yourself for? House? A car? A pair of sneakers? You understand? What will you give yourself for? But Christ, he gave himself for the church. He gave himself for the beta Christian, as we are to give ourselves, you understand, for our wives and love our wives who are in the order. See, when everything is in the proper order, you understand, there's no injustice there. You understand, because everything keeps checks and balances of everything else in Adonai. In job. But see, we've fallen so deep into this Babylonian living like the Joneses, you know, saying, living in the image of the white man. That's why the situation of black people in the Americas, the lost sheep is so cursed. You know what I'm But Christ, he gave himself for the church. He loved the church. He loved his brothers and his sisters. You know what I'm saying? He didn't snitch them out. He didn't betray them. For, for for 30 or for 300 pieces of silver. See, when you see Judas, his betrayal, it's interesting there. It's very interesting. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like a sign of what we have here with the golden calf in this Torah portion. Tekebele or Kitissa. Verse 26, that he might sanctify. Why did he give himself? So he might sanctify. Sanctify means to make Yetekedesa holy. And cleanse it by what? By doing what? with the washing of water by the word. This is the key right here. This is what the this is what the um the 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 k k ayor, the k or the k or the k or or the kior as some say, which was donated by who? The woman. What you mean it was donated by the woman? You understand? Well let's let's deal with this part right here so you can understand how it was donated by the woman. This is a beautiful part right here because you know, um these people were giving what they had. You understand? Were giving what they had and think about lost sheep. They got so much. You understand? They want and they still not happy. They still psychologically caught up on pharmaceuticals and drugs going mad, so forth and so on. A whole generation a whole generation gone. Verse 17 of Exodus chapter 30. Who may worship? This is still the great worship chapter. Speaking of the cleanse. And Yahweh spake to Musa saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. 
or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire to Yahweh. So they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not, and it shall be a statute forever, a surat, to Izaz, but to Izaz, surat, but surat, a surat forever to them, even to him and his seed, his race, throughout their generations. Now, when you go f forward, when they actually start to make this implement, you know, well, later on you'll see when they start to make this actual, you know, make it, that it's the woman who donated, you understand? I think they donated their mirrors, they donated of their jewelry to make this brazen, brazen altar. You understand? To make this brazen altar. Who may worship? Now, we get to the anointing, which is the next part of the anointing. The anointing oil, we know, is a type of the Memphis Caduce, the Holy Spirit for service. We find that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 8. You remember the part where Christ, he washed the feet of the disciples? And remember, Peter was like, no, 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 you can't wash my feet. You're my master. And, P and Yeshua said that if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part of me. And then, then Peter got a little silly. Peter was like, well, then wash me all over. And it was, uh, Yeshua said, come on. You know, anybody who's bathed from morning, all they need is have their feet washed. That's the part that's becoming constantly defiled. Now, the feet is very important. The feet is very important. And I think we just need to touch on the feet. We already know the hands are symbolic of the work. You understand the work you do. In other words, to wash yourself from such defilement as the Sabbath even is a means to washing our spirit. You understand? And washing our psychological from the weekly defilement because see those those six days of the week are for us to do our occupational labor and get money get money you understand to to build the kingdom you see because he gives us wealth so that we do what not that we we talk about some fake prosperity and and get stuck in babylon living like living like golden calf worshipers no but that we build his kingdom he gives us the power to get wealth so we may establish his what covenant you understand? Not some, some, some makeup stuff that your preacher or pastor told you, but it's covenant. That's why their feet have not been washed. Think about it for a moment. How many churches you go in and they say, oh, brother, sister, we got to wash your feet. This is, what, this is what Yeshua told us. I mean, even we don't really do that, but the more we think about it, it's something that we should do. Think about it for a moment. If you say, well, there's a certain time of year. I don't think that's what Christ meant. He didn't say at a certain time of the year you're going to do this. He basically gave these things says, whatever you see me do, you do. Think about it. Whatever you see. Now, why is this important? Because metaphysically, when we speak about the feet, the feet is the phase of our understanding, our master wow, which comes into constant contact with substance, with substance, material, material. See, substance abuse is not just drugs. Substance abuse is materialism. is substance abuse. Because we got substance, but we don't, we're not... Purified, purified from it, so we become defiled by it, and we abuse it instead of use it. So the phase of our overstanding or master wow, which comes into contact with substance, consequently, we can take possession of all substance that we comprehend and understand. Any, subs any material, we can take possession spiritually of it in the name of Yah. In the name of Jah, in the name of the great I am, in the name of Joshua. This is the meaning of Joshua when we get forward to Joshua chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, to you have I given it as I spake to Musa. This is what was said to Joshua, Old Testament Joshua, who is a likeness, you know what I'm saying, of Joshua our Lord and Savior in the New Testament. So wherever his foot touched, you understand, was given. So that, that's, that's, that's a powerful thing right there. You understand, that's a powerful thing right there. The feet are the most willing and patient servants of the body. Remember my earthly father told me, take care of your feet. They have to carry you everywhere you got to go. No, serious thing. Your feet got to carry you everywhere you go. See, niggas talking about sneakers. 
They're more dealing with sneakers and these shoes and the woman dealing with these high heels and hurting their back and hurting their feet and corns and bunions and so forth and so on. But think about it. The feet are the most willing and patient servants of the body. Though you're wearing the wrong kind of shoes, your feet will, will still try to get you where you got to go. They go all day at the bidding of the mind. Wherever you tell yourself, yeah, I want to go check that out. Your feet just fire. Your feet don't say, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to take a rest. You go by yourself. But the feet do the bidding of the mind, and upon them rest the burden of the thought of materiality. You see, Western science hasn't gotten up to that. Some people even know this. Some of y'all might even do this yourself. You might, like, after a long day's work or whatever, like, you might soak your feet. You understand? Remember old-time folk used to do that? Like, our grand, great-grandparents used to soak their feet and everything like that. We say, why are you soaking your feet? Just take a bath. You know what I'm saying? We don't really understand that, and we still don't. But watch. If Dr. Oz does something on TV, the Wizard of Oz, Oprah's Wizard of Oz, right? And do something on TV or the doctors or one of these other people, they start talking about it, like on the evening news, you got to check out this story, it's great for your health and everything. Then everybody's going to be like, oh, yeah, washing the feet is so correct. Then they'll be saying, Ross, you was right about that. No, the Bible, the Scripture was already right about that, but you really didn't study it, you didn't read it, and part of the fault might be your pastor, Pastor Bacon and Reverend Porkchops probably really didn't really tell you that because they were just concerned about you, you know, giving them money so you can, so you can fund their, their um, di dissolute lifestyle. Because they figure you don't know any better because they're not teaching you Bible. So you wouldn't know any better to really check up on them. The more we admit in matter, check this out, the greater the burden that's laid upon the feet. Think about this for a moment. Now, now this is, this is, this is to my metaphysical, talking about, they talk about new age science. Well, I guess Christ, true Christ man science would be new age. You understand? Since they're in that old age of idolatry, it would be sim seemingly new age science. Because the feet of the what? The feet of the most willing and the most patient servants of the body. They go all day at the bidding of the mind, and upon them rest the burden of the thought. The burden of the thought of materiality. You see, Babylon don't measure those things. You see, because because they can't. They don't have no spirit, no no fear. What's it? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They don't got this wisdom just yet. You understand? Unless they get a piece of it from the East, from yoga or Hinduism. You understand? Maybe they might put it a little bit together. But the more we admit in matter, the more we admit in material, substance, worldliness, possessions, the greater the burden laid upon the feet and the more tired they become. Have you noticed that? Before, the, you remember the great-grandmothers and grandfathers said, I had to walk to school. Remember back in the days, they didn't have too much, but they could walk a long distance. Like when you see the Africans come from Africa, you understand, they can run the marathon. As soon as they're here for a little while, you understand, and they get in the material life, they can't even walk to the store. You understand, they got to get a cab to go to the corner store or something like that. People can't walk no more. Because the more they think materialism, the heavier the burden on the feet. See, it doesn't make so much sense when Christ washed the disciples' feet. People don't get it. People think it's just a rich, oh, yeah, well, you know, I wash my own feet. I don't want nobody to touch my feet. You understand what did Christ say to Peter? Well, then you, I, you, there's no part of you, you know. Buy. Well, I, I'd be giving tithe. But you could give tithe off and whatever, but you're not giving your heart and your mind to the Lord. You, you see, remember about the, the shekel, rich and poor, you know, it's not more for the rich, less for the poor. No, it's one basic, it's a basic idea. You know what I'm saying? It's that basic idea. So the more one's admit and believe in matter, the greater the burden that's laid upon the feet and the more tired they become. Now, the denial of materiality is illustrated where? In the washing, as we've been saying, of the disciples' feet by Yeshua in John chapter 13, verses 5 to 10. Now, how does this connect right here? Remember, this is the worship chapter in Exodus chapter 30 of this Torah portion, the 21st Torah portion that we're studying. But we want to show you how the Old Testament type when followed through consistently in Scripture, Scripture explains Scripture. You know what I'm saying? So the heathen, the devil, the so-called Lucifer or Lucifer is confounded. Even Petros, Peter, who represents spiritual faith. When we talk about K through 12, there are 12 disciples. You need to understand each of the 12 disciples as they fit into the temple of man. So you can really understand how Judas or Iscariot betrayed the Savior, when you understand what power in man, and it was what aspect of man's body 
you understand, is Judah. <laughs> Even Peter now, who represents spiritual faith, must be cleansed. Peter is spiritual faith. You know, he's like, I will go there. You know, I, I, you know, I would die for you. You know, he he didn't even he, he didn't really even think about really what he was saying. But that's that spiritual faith. He he was willing to. You understand? But he needed to be cleansed. You see, the main thing is that he needed to be cleansed. What did he need to be cleansed of? Well, it's very clear when we when we study that portion of the scripture. He needed to be cleansed from the the belief. You understand, or the false admittance in the reality of material conditions. Because Peter was like one of those ones that said, yeah, yeah, I'm there for you, yo, yo, I'm your dog, so forth and so on. But then when the thing really happened, you see how many people on the other side, he's like, uh, why don't we do this another time? Or like, yeah, we need to get some more brothers up in here. You, you know what I mean? So because he was not cleansed from the reality of material. He had a belief in the reality of the material conditions, but he was not cleansed, so he could not see the real spiritual conditions. Not even the part, I think it was, was it Elijah or the prophet? Um, when they had a war, I think it was the Syrians or someone, and one of the ones was panicking, and I think it was Elijah or Elisha, the prophet was saying, open, open up the one's eyes so they can see all the spiritual angels. You know, you can see the, our real extraterrestrial brothers, who are all around because they were looking at what they had, but they couldn't see spiritually that there were spiritual forces on their behalf. When you look at the reality of the material numbers, like we only have a few in material condition, but to wash the feet, it seems like a menial thing. But in this humble way, Yeshua, he taught and he exemplified the willingness of divine love to serve, that true divine love serves. It doesn't seek to be served that man may be redeemed. Redeemed from what? From the pride of the flesh. Now notice how important that is, the pride of the flesh. Because we're talking about, we're talking about in this chapter right here, in this Torah portion, um, we're talking about, um, we're, we're going to get to uh, what is the golden calf. But see how all this leads up to the golden calf. What does John says? Love not the world nor the things that are in the world. You understand? Love not the world or things that are in the world. And it speaks about the, the the pride. You understand? The pride of, you know, the pride of the flesh. The pride of, uh, here's, a, here's a scripture right here. First John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Children must not love the present world. But see, this is the golden calf worship that people are going through. In this present time of worshiping all the bling bling, you know what I mean? Like with the Israelites, you understand? Like with the Israelites right here, worship all this bling bling, they're loving the present world. And when you connect that revelation, you find this chapter 13, the verse 3, is a very good connection. Because when we get to verse 18, there you go, mark of the beast, chi sti stigma. Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the seclorum, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. And the what? The pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of Jah, the will of God, abideth forever. See, it's very important not to love this world and to get unplugged from that. You know what I'm saying? To use these things godly and wisely, but not to abuse these things. You know what I'm saying? To love Jah. You understand? And use these things in the world to fulfill that love of Jah and not to be used or abused by these things in the world. Because when the world passes away, what was interesting, we was looking at this um, from the, you remember the signs against Egypt, Jah's signs? And this is something very interesting right here. I don't know if you can see this chart too well right here. But this shows the, the, the ten plagues. If you look at each of the ten plagues, you'll find something very, very interesting. And we thought this was interesting, actually, when we looked at it, that you'll see that there's a first, there's a second, and there's a third cycle, right? And these are the ten plagues. This is the plague. Blood, frogs, gnats, lice, flies, wild beasts, livestock, boil, hail, locust, darkness, firstborn. Now, was there a warning? You see which ones had a warning, right? 
Now, notice when we get to darkness, darkness had no warning. When the darkness came, it had no warning. You understand? Know when the death of the firstborn, it had no warning. So look how many signs of this that we see in this modern-day spiritual Egypt come to pass. And that darkness reminded me about this whole 2012, you understand, know or this dark day of the Lord. Remember, it says it would be a dark day. You understand? I don't think it would just be an eclipse. You understand? It's going to be much, much darker. Imagine right now, people who are so caught up on the things of the world, if there's no internet, there's no cell phone, there's no cable, you understand, you can't get on your Facebook, you understand, you can't get online, you can't even get on the YouTubes, so forth and so on. You, can you imagine the darkness? You see, it's a spiritual darkness. You understand, it doesn't have to be just a, oh, there's no light, but there's no spiritual light. You understand, and this is where this world is right now. It's in that mode of passing away. But let's get through this right here on the feet. You see, we want to touch on the feet for a moment. You understand? Um, I want to say that Jah has a, a foot fetish. You understand? But he overstands. You know, there's a focus, a particular focus on the feet. Yeshua showed that particular focus on the feet. Not that it's just the physical feet, but the feet are connected. You have to remember that, that our physical body, you know what I'm saying, is a is kind of like a growth on the soul. In other words, the physical body extends in that sense from the soul. That that we have a psychic body and a spiritual body that's in the image that we know as man. You see, but the the, the condensation that's brought us down, why do you think Christ walked on water? You, you, you understand? And, and certain transfigurations and certain things that we even see that ones are able to do, even in different lower religions, based on even simple things like mind over matter. You understand? And we're not even talking about the spiritual mind of God over the temporal matter, but we're talking about basically what man has done through a certain discipline of the mind. But when we speak right here about that there had been contention among the disciples as to who would sit at the master's right and at the master's left in the kingdom. Now, Yeshua, he was putting an end to the strife by bringing home to his followers the truth that he who willingly performs lowly or humble service for others with no thought for personal distinction is the greatest in John's kingdom. Yeshua, he signifies the I am. And the feet represent that phase of the understanding which connects one with the outer, which connects one with the outer or the manifest world and reveals the right relationship toward worldly conditions in general. So can you imagine? Right now, it's like, Ones and ones are worshiping the shoes and the sneakers and stuff like that. Can you see what happens now? So if the feet represents that, then it's like they took the what? They took the chains off. Did they really take the chains off? Did they really take, you know, people are more concerned with the kind of shoes that they are sneakers they're wearing on their feet than even the condition of their feet. It would hurt their feet so they can look to other people because they are trying to please that present passing world. I mean, just look at the fashion. The fashions change so fast. You understand? That's why people have to continually keep up with these fashions, and this keeps them on this rat race, you understand, loop, why they don't recognize what's really going on in the real world. But this is what connects one with the out of the feet, the world, and reveals the right relationship toward worldly conditions in general. So the washing of the disciples' feet by Yeshua, it therefore typifies a cleansing process or, on a higher level, a denial of personality and materiality. What does the loss, the loss always be saying? You don't know who I am. You don't know who I am. They don't even know who they are either. You understand? So they're caught up on this trying to affirm a false personality, a false ego. This is where the loss of soul comes in, a false ego. Not that, they, they have not denied this false personality that's based on materiality. So it's interesting that when we go to the Old Testament, the Balui Kidan, there's this focus right here on the priests, you understand, washing their hands and their feet. You understand, before they could go to the next level, and you know what the next level after 
the washing, which we can say is a likeness on a, on a symbolic level to baptism, but the real washing is the washing, you understand, by the word. You understand, is a real cleansing, as it says right here, the, the spiritual cleansing washed by the word, the devar of the scriptures as we are often defiled in our daily walks, that time to meditate, that, that meditation on the word, that meditation on the scriptures, that, that spiritual harmony, you understand that, as it says in um, um, Ephesians, let's just go back to Ephesians before we, Ephesians chapter 5, it's a very beautiful part in 19 and, 19 and 20 in Ephesians 5, 19 and 20, speaking to yourselves in Psalms. Not these crazy songs out there, you know, that they call church songs. No, some of the Psalms of David, you know, the Psalms of David. You know, Christ could care less about these songs people making up in the world. You understand? He said David is a man after his own heart. We don't know about these other people making up these funky songs and call them ghost spell. You know, they need to go spell and read the Bible. You understand? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and, make, and making melody, in your heart to the Lord, you understand, in your heart. So it's not even an outer thing getting on stage and performing for a lot of folks and they clap and they smile and say, oh, I did. they like me. You know, no, no, it's, it's to the Lord. The Lord, Adonai, Yeshua, he is your audience. Jehovah's giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of Getachin Yesus Christ, Adonai Yeshua HaMoshiach. So that's speaking to yourselves. You see, taking time to, in what way speaking to yourselves? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to Adonai. Because now after this washing, so what do we have? We have, we have, first of all, the altar of, of incense, of aishans. We have the redeemed and the shekel, or the, the bur, the bur, you understand, that, that half shekel, actually, the atonement money. We have the cleansing, which is like, say, the baptism, the washing, and then we have the anointing. Now, I've often taught this like, like this. And I've looked at it, you know, it kind of just popped out. I didn't get it at first, so some of you might not get it at first, but hopefully this might help, is that when you see the order of it, such as the Schofield Study Reference Bible kind of breaks it down in the margin that give you scripture to compare with scripture, you see one thing very interesting. You see where, where the washing goes first before the anointing. You see what happens in a lot of these counterfeit churches, they anoint before they wash. Think about it for a moment. When you go and you bathe, right? Right? You go and you bathe, and, and you say, oh, man, I got I to gotta bathe. You don't put on oil first, and then you go wash, wash up, wash off the oil. You first wash, <laughs> you know what I mean, and then you anoint. So it, it shows there's an order. You see what I'm saying? In other words, most of these, these counterfeit false Jehovah worship and a lot of the black churches out there, what they do to confuse the people because they're based on white supremacy and antichrist religion, they have not, they have not been born truly again, is that they have people saying, I'm a Christian. Yes, I accept Christ. I'm a Christian. And they wasn't even washed. Washed by what? Don't you see this right here? Spiritual cleansing, washing by the var of scriptures. Now, of course, people say, well, this is the Old Testament. But we just showed you in Ephesians chapter 5, New Testament, and it's a very same principle. We showed you also Christ chapter 13, washing the feet, the very same principle right here. Before entering what? Before entering the inner court. You see, so there's an outer court. And remember, this right here is in the outer court. You understand, this is in the outer court, the brazen altar. Let's see if we can show you a pic of the brazen altar the, right here. The brazen altar, too, is in the outer court. You see the brazen altar right here? This is also in the outer court. So these are in the outer court. So it's like if you were to go step by step, first you come to the brazen altar. You understand? That's like first you come to that point where you admit your your chatiyat, your sins, like when ones will bring their so-called animal sacrifice, you understand, and would burn that, put, will lay their hand on the animal as that animal would, and, and confess whatever it is that they did, and that animal will be slain, but that really meant that you should have been slain, but in the kapar of Jah, of God, you were not. So, 
you see, in the true spiritual, you'd be like, wow, that was, that was me supposed to be burnt right there. That's like coming to the feet of the cross, coming to Christ. You know what I'm saying? Coming to, but the feet of, this <laughs> is so interesting. Um, we wanted to show actually the outline of the tabernacle. We showed it before. I'm sure some of you all remember a, a kind of a, a, um, a, a top view of the tabernacle when you draw the cross over the tabernacle and you see Christ on the cross as symbolic in a sense of the tabernacle. At the foot of Christ is what? Think about it for a moment. We're going to touch on it, y'all willing, in the next set of videos because you all really need to understand this whole skull and bones thing Christologically. It is Christ was crucified in a place they call um, Golgotha, you understand, or, 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 or Calvary, you understand, and that was known as the place of what? Skull. The place of the skull. The skull and the what? The bones. So Christ's cross you know what I'm saying? At the foot of the cross is the the skull and the bone of who? You know what I'm saying? Of the sacrifice of the one who has died. You know what I'm saying? So when you come into the tabernacle, the first place you meet right here is the brazen altar or the mizabah or koshet. You understand? Know the the altar that was made of brass. You understand? Know now we see down here that the Messiah Yeshua. He was able to endure Yahweh's fiery judgment. Remember when, when the disciples saying that they won't be on the left or the right, or the mom came and said, hey, put my one son here, one son there. And he was like, well, are, are they, I, I can't do that, but are they able to endure the baptism that I'm about to be baptized? They probably thought it was the water. Christ speaking about the fire. The fire where? The fire before the water. You know, in the Bible, in the Psalms, it says that, and from water to fire and fire to water, he used these two, you know, when it's talking about the tribulation period, that they went through the fire and they went through the water. Because the fire is the brazen altar, and the water is the lava. Because they had to run back and forth from these two spots because they felt their conscience not worthy to enter in to the inner court. But now you have one, one, one hour old Christian talking about, because they heard somebody t tell them some yabba dabba do, and all you do is just say, Jesus, and say the sinner's prayer. Why, where's that in my Bible? Where did you get that sinner's prayer from? I, I don't see that in my Bible. Oh, it's not about the Bible? And then these people run off, and they start their own congregation. You understand, they are, you know, to stop the progress, they start their congress. You understand, they start their regress. You, you have sense of spiritual progress. So we see within that lack of preparation, you understand, because all of these, you understand, Christ fulfilled. So you cannot tell me if Christ fulfilled this and you're a New Testament Christian and I ask you, what did Christ fulfill? And you say, oh, he fulfilled all the Old Testament types and parables. Well, ex explain to me, son. You know, let me, you know, explain to me, son. You understand? But they don't go there because they're not his. So we just want to show you this, 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 um, you know, these elements, because I know we've talked about this and we might talk about this and speak about this a lot, but it's important really to understand how they work together. You understand? How these things are basically types that Christ in spirit and in truth fulfill. Because when we look at the altar right here, let, 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 let's just look at this right here. This would be this will be the altar right here, as you see. This will be the altar, and that right there would be the lava. Before they could even be worthy, you understand? They had to be cleansed from constant defilement. So how all of a sudden somebody's going to run in here and run up there and say they're running it, and they don't even know um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, as Christ fulfills it. So what are they preaching? You understand they're preaching a false gospel, not the glorious gospel. The glorious gospel is teaching how Christ fulfilled from, from Genesis to Revelation. You understand? And how that's applicable for us in our real world lives. So who may worship? That's a good question. They say just throw your hands up in the air. It's something they do with the golden calf. They threw their hands up in the air. You understand? And said any nonsense. And we're going to come across that pretty soon right here. So we have the anointing is the next aspect. The anointing is the next aspect um, that we have from verse 22 to verse 33. We're going to get into some of the detail of the anointing, but as we continue to move forward, we want to touch on 
complete this particular chapter. We've been in chapter 30 for a moment. You know, we're saying we still want to get to the to the to the broken law and the golden calf, but understanding how do we get there? What the people turned their backs on? You know, we're saying the real worship. The, the next part of worship 34 to 38 is the incense, which is check this out. The incense, really, the incense. Because we're not talking about frankincense. We're talking about Aishans. Anyone who has studied the scripture will recognize that the frankincense is not to be confounded, not to be confused. The frankincense is not to be confused with the incense, which was to be added as it is used apart from incense. In other words, frankincense is used in one sense, and then there's an Aishans that the scriptures tell you that is different than the incense. Now, we are told what composed the Aishans, never in Scripture what the frankincense was. <laughs> All basically speaks of crystals. That's an interesting note that Schofield gives right there. The sweet spices of those perfections which may be apprehended. The frankincense of that which God saw in Jesus as ineffable. In other words, the particular, what they call frankincense, in other words, what we think in the West, without studying it from the best or the scripture, is, is something far different. Because people will make you think that all the incense and frankincense was all the same thing. No, it wasn't. In fact, the frankincense, according to the scripture, is so ineffable, in other words, it's undescribable, that God doesn't even describe it. He gives accurate description of everything. But he does not give the description of this particular frankincense right here. And the Schofield note at this point is interesting because here we learn the, the final aspect. After the anointing, the final, which is the Christina, which is, which is becoming christened, or a Mashaha Moshiach, you know, which is the whole community, the worship, the incense, the type of prayer and praise. It is for Adonai. It is for the Lord. It is spiritual and not sensuous. See, this is where we talk about these counterfeit churches that have gone wrong with their so-called praise and worship. That's why a lot of these praise and worship artists, you know what I'm saying, they, they're now going out there in the world and doing all kind of worldly music. Uh, you see what happened with Whitney Houston? That should be an example for y'all. Uh-huh. So we ask the Baptist church, baptism, as you see right here, if we call it baptism, is just one part of the, of, of the whole that he gives us. So imagine if you start a congregation just on that. It's like we start a, a church, we call it incense, frankincense church. You know what I mean? Or start a church, you know, that's, that, that's just based on one small aspect of it. That means you basically have given up on everything else. You understand? And that means you're not, you don't have the full armor to deal with this wicked world. And that's why most of these churches cannot deal with the wicked world, but they're in compromise. They have compromised themselves, you understand, to the world, and they no longer challenge. They're not a challenge to the world as the early church was. You understand? I mean, you know, they, they would not be crucified as their so-called master wolf, because they're no threat to the world. They're in bed with the world. You know what I'm saying? Just like Jezebel. You know what I'm saying? But the spiritual, the spiritual worship and praise is not sensuous. This is the interesting key. It's not sensuous. If you listen to a lot of the church music now, it's like now they're trying to con you into something. You know, they're trying to catch you. They're trying to do the tune like that tune out there in the world you'd like. And then they might throw a, a God in it, and, and maybe he. They'll say, and he, he's my Lord. What's his name? They don't want him to say his name. You understand? Or they'll say his name and won't call him a Lord. You know what I'm saying? They, they'll say Jesus like he's, he's their buddy. He's our Lord. He's our Adonai. He's our master. So in this last part right here, it basically says, and we just want to go over this concerning the incense, the type of prayer, and praise. So the Aishans is a type of prayer and praise. And Yahweh said to Musa, Take to thee sweet spices, stacta, 
um, anica, galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense. Now remember we said there's a difference between the Aishans, incense, and frankincense. Of each shall there be a like weight. So all of them of like weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. Notice that these are all separate things, but they're all being brought together to make it what? Pure and holy. Not saying pure is holy or holy is pure, but both pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small and put it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with thee. So some of it is to be made small and taken into the what? The tent, the tabernacle. It's taken to the tabernacle, and Yahweh says, where or there I will meet with thee. It shall be to you most holy, because that's in the inside or in the holy place, or the most holy place, which is the inside. That means you are in this tent area. And we'll touch on what, how that looks in that tent area and where the altar of incense is. So that incense is taken there, you understand, and it's put, you understand, a small portion of it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. So according to how it's composed, that's not how you'll make it to yourself. It doesn't say you're not going to have any of this for yourself, but there's a, there's, the, the, it says clearly, it says, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the what composition thereof. It shall be to the holy for the Lord. In other words, it's use as all these spices of equal weight, of equal measure, is produced for Yahweh. Verse 38 to complete the chapter. Whosoever shall make like that to smell there too shall be cut off from his people. Whoever shall make like that, you know, like they're going to do their own thing. So that, that would almost be saying that there's one tabernacle. You understand? How can there be a whole bunch of storefront, a whole bunch of churches all over the place? You know what I mean? Because somebody is breaking away, and they are cut off from his people. So he's clearly saying that there is one order for his people. It's not you just pick it up and do your own thing here or there. So it's very important that we understand this pattern. You know what I'm saying? This pattern, because what is condemned here is making worship a mere pleasure to the natural man. And this is where the church, the modern so-called black church, have fallen off similar to the Israelites did in the golden calf time, you understand? They had made um, worship a mere pleasure to the natural man, and they forgot about the spiritual man, you understand? Whether sensuous, as in beautiful music to please the ear, or eloquence, merely to give delight to the natural mind. And that right there is a, is a teaching in itself. You understand, when we get into the condemnation of this false gospel, this false prayer and worship thing, because all it does is appeal to the sensuous side, the natural side, while the spiritual, you understand, and the soul, you understand, is lost. When you appeal to that natural side, it's like selling your soul because nothing, the word is supposed to appeal to the spiritual and the psychological aspect. You, you understand, this is why you find for most so-called Christians, they cannot find the answers they need in God, in the Bible, in the world, because in the Word, because they are taught, you understand, that it's supposed to just, you know, like, I like how this preacher looks. I like how he talks. I like how this band sings. And I, that's really holy because I like it. No. <laughs> no, it's not really holy, but it's appealing you understand, to the natural man. You understand, it's appealing to the sense of your ear. You understand, not your spiritual ear. You understand, the eloquence is giving delight to your natural mind, but it's to the neglect of your spiritual 
overstanding. So, brothers and sisters, we just touched on this chapter. We're going to move forward to the workmen in the tabernacle, those who are given the skills. You see, this is Jai's masons. That's going to be the next part on Jai's masons. Yeah, Jai has masons. Are they free? Well, 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 they are free in job, but they don't have to say they're free of job like the Freemasons. That's why they, they serve Satan. They do whatever they want to do. They do what they wilt. You know what I'm saying? But we do Jah's will. So we have Masons, workmen, and laborers coming up in Chapter 31. And we also have the Sabbath as a sign, as a sign between Jah and his people, between Yahweh and Israel, between Jah and and his people is very key that we understand this Sabbath sign. And this is what we are remembering even in keeping the Sabbath, the Shabbat set apart. Brothers and sisters, Shabbat Shalom, Senbet Salam, Shalom Rastafari. More to come, y'all willing. Stay tuned. Shalom.